All right. Uh, what is generally called the English Revolutionary Period spans quite a long time because England goes through major political upheaval, uh, really from the early 1600s for the whole for the entire 1600s, really, uh, through one generation after another. Um, historians have written a lot of books on all these things. So, again, just like everything else we talk about in this class, uh, issues that we talk about for five or ten minutes, you could take an entire class on at the university level. So there's tons of research on all this stuff. Um, I like to emphasize the English Revolutionary Period in my classes because I personally see it as one of the first instances of a kind of, at least in some form of popular uprising to get rid of a king and get some kind of democracy-ish type government, or at least democracy as we would know it today, where people get to choose their own leaders. Um, this revolution, or this series of revolutions is not going to be entirely pro-democracy. It's mostly going to be kind of criticizing the king. Uh, so there's going to be several different groups involved. We'll get into the big mess of the thing. Um, well, we're really going to start with Elizabeth and go all the way through the rest of the century and highlight uh, some of the major arguments and major kind of movements within England that were happening. Um, okay, so again, we'll start. No, well, it's not even on. There. Uh, We'll start with Elizabeth, which is really the last English monarch that we have talked about so far through this semester. Um, the last time we really talked about England was when she was queen in the 1500s, uh, doing battle against the Spanish and whatnot. Uh, she remains queen for quite a long time. Uh, she dies, basically she was getting old and she got sick and died in 1603. Uh, but she had no children because, at least no children that we know about, no official children that were recognized by the government as the heir to the throne. She was never married, therefore any children she had could not be the legitimate heir to the throne. Um, so this was a major problem in English politics as she's getting older in the 1590s and first few years of the 1600s. Uh, it's a major source of worry for a lot of people in England because one of her great accomplishments was staving off some kind of civil war over religion between Catholics and Protestants in England. Um, she had balanced them, was very good at it, uh, and since she has no official heir to her throne, there's a lot of worry, especially amongst Protestants, that once she dies, there might be a new civil war where a Catholic gets to the throne and starts persecuting Protestants again. Does that make sense? So especially the Protestant side in England was very concerned about finding another person to be the next monarch that would promise to tolerate Protestantism, will not persecute people, throw them in jail and torture them and all that kind of stuff, execute people just for being Protestant. So the eventual idea that her high advisors hit on in her last few years of her life, um, they eventually get her to agree to this on her deathbed, is to take one of her distant cousins, who is already king of Scotland, the country to the north. Uh, his name is James. He is a distant member of her family. So he has a, a distant connection in her family tree. And that when she dies, he will become the next king of England while remaining king of Scotland. So he'll be king of both at the same time, starting in 1603. So he becomes king of England on Elizabeth's death. He moves south, moves to London, and lives in England basically for the rest of his life. And uh, becomes known as King James I of England while he is still... James the Seventh of Scotland. So he is king over two different governments at the same time. Yeah. Question. Because there are already other uh, six guys named King James in Scottish history. 
but he's the first in English history. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. And uh, James is, a lot of English people view him as, a, as pretty awkward. He's from a different country, so he doesn't speak like the English dialect of what we think of today as the English language very well. He speaks a Scottish version. He understands Scottish culture and Scottish government. So he's kind of like an outsider who doesn't really understand English norms and ways of living all that much. Does that make sense? So he, he's kind of portrayed as strange guy, not very confident in kind of bringing his own will, his, uh, enforcing his will on the English government. So that's one reason I like this picture of him. He looks kind of anxious. Um, a lot of scholars today think of him as a very smart king, very kind of focused on the long term and very cautious. He realized that going into this what was to him a foreign government, he didn't want to make big changes because any change he makes could upset a lot of people. So uh, he even wrote a book advising his sons how to run the government once he's dead, once they become kings. And the book is basically, avoid all problems. Don't do anything controversial. Don't take any big risks. Um, he even advises them not even to get involved in gambling or anything because it might like drag their name through the mud or something like that. So he's very just socially conscious and conservative. Yeah? Is that why they chose him to um, take the queen's place when she died, or did they advise him to be that way? Uh, it's basically, it seems like his advisors, the same advisors that were helping Elizabeth, they continue in government, so they continue running the government in his name, though. So he's basically following their advice. The advisors, especially in these monarchies, are massively important to the government. Right? Um, the king back then is kind of like a president today. The president doesn't really know everything about taxes and war and I don't know, bridge building, all this kind of stuff, right? So the presidents rely on these series of advisors that are experts in their individual fields, and they study a problem. They say, this is what we advise you to do, and the president takes it or leaves it. That's basically what kings were back then, and a lot of kings still are today, where they exist. Um, so you don't see a, a, massive, a massive upheaval in the government. It, it's very consistent, and uh, he seems to have liked it that way. Uh, so he's a keep things going the way they are kind of king. Doesn't want to make big changes in any way, because any change could be a threat to him. But. Uh, he's already middle-aged by the time he gets to the throne, so he doesn't last all that long. He dies in 1625, and his son, named Charles, becomes king of England and Scotland at the same time. Um, Charles is a very different kind of guy than his father. Charles is largely raised and educated in England. He understands English society, he understands English politics, and uh, his biggest criticism against his father seems to have been that his father was too cautious. His father wasn't willing to kind of push the government to do something. So Charles seems to have thought that his father was kind of weak-willed, right? Um, Charles is an extremely, has an extremely conservative view of religion and government. Um, and when he gets to the throne, he starts to really put his stamp on government in ways that by now are pretty unfamiliar to people for 20 years. Um, he talks about England is an absolute state where the king is all powerful, or virtually all powerful. England's a little different than other countries. Um, England has a parliament which is, part of it at least, elected by the English landowners, anyone who owns property. Um, any adult man that owns property, put it that way. I think he had to be something like uh, 25 years old and own land to get, a, get the right to vote for your member of parliament. Parliament's kind of like Congress. Uh, so it's a little bit more democracy-ish, but it's still run by the king. Uh, parliament cannot pass laws without the king's approval. 
And uh, when this king gets to the throne, he starts trying to push Parliament around to get them to do what he wants. And sometimes they're a little resistant. They disagree with what he wants. And he tries to uh, you know, throw down the card of, I'm the king, you should do what I say. And that doesn't really fly very far. Uh, but he talks about the royal right to rule, that he is God's appointed person to run this place. So he very much believes in it and starts appointing a whole slew of new advisors who believe in it. And uh, the administration, uh, the executive branch of the government, is really seen as very heavy-handed once this guy gets to the throne. Yes? Uh, he is fairly tolerant of Protestants. Um, he is thought to secretly be Catholic. Um, he doesn't want to say so publicly because that might start a civil war. Uh, but he puts advisors, um, very staunchly Catholic guys in high positions of the government. Uh, and in, he starts enforcing laws that hadn't really been enforced very stringently for a long time, especially against uh, publishing certain things that are critical of government. Like people under his father could get away with like publishing like funny books about government satires. Uh, he starts throwing people in jail for it. And there's a, a couple famous instances of a, there's this one really smart lawyer in England who figured he could, he could get away with it and publish this big book of satire, basically. And uh, the king's advisors brought him to trial for it, found him guilty, and uh, publicly disfigured him as an example to the rest of the country that you're not going to get away with this anymore. Cut off the guy's ears. So, uh, because because he would walk around in society and everyone would see it. Does it make sense? It's something you notice. And uh, the guy's response was to simply grow his hair out to try to cover it, but it doesn't really work. So, yeah. Uh, so the message went out that you know this criticism of the high government leaders isn't really going to fly anymore. The government's really going to come after people. Uh, so um, a lot of the, the, just like today, if the government got very heavy-handed again, I mean, th this king argues that this is kind of uh, stopping the, the immorality in the country, right? Trying to tap down, try, try to end all the, the questionable things that people are doing in their private lives to make uh, the people basically a better people a more God-fearing, God-following, moral, ethical type people. Does that make sense? Um, so just like you hear today people talking about how we should punish certain crimes much more heavily than we do, there's, there's a lot of very conservative people out there that would like to see that kind of stuff. So uh, some people in England of his time think he see him as a hero. He's finally enforcing the laws the way they should be. Um, but a lot of people say this guy's going way beyond what is seen as normal, so a lot of people are very scared of this guy. Um, eventually, he starts getting involved in a kind of series of disputes with Parliament to the point where he doesn't really like their position anymore. He completely disagrees with some of their leaders, so he closes Parliament. He dissolves it. Sends out an official proclamation. Parliament doesn't have to meet anymore. They can just go home. I'll run the country myself. That's what dissolving parliament means. So this would be like if the President of the United States went on TV one night and said, Congress has given me problems for years. I don't like what they're doing. They're wacky, done whatever he wants to say. Um, Congress is closed. Go home. I'll run the country myself. So that's a big step to take, right? Um, and this starts uh, what historians have called the era of his personal rule over the country because he ruled the country personally. He didn't have parliament around to make laws for him anymore. The problem with that, without parliament, he can't pass laws by himself. He needs the elected kind of leaders of England to support whatever he wants. So what laws are being passed in this era of personal rule? None. There's no new laws on the books. He's just enforcing all the same stuff year after year after year. There's no changes because there's no parliament to make changes. Does that make sense? 
So he gets away with it for a while, but he's going to run into problems in the 1640s. Uh, so that's Charles I. Questions about him at all? We'll keep coming back to him. But that's kind of broad outline of his view of the world and of government. Uh, more pictures of him. Um, let's see. Okay. Here's a map of what is called the British Islands kind of system, uh, or at least most of it. There should be an Ireland out here in the west. It's not on this map, but that's fine. Um, here's England. England is the southern half of the island. Um, England has already conquered this place called Wales. So Wales is part of England by this point. Uh, Scotland is to the north in this bluer area, um, back then an independent country. And the king of England and the king of Scotland by this point are the same guy. So Charles I is king of England in London and king of Scotland at the same time. Um, Charles I is also trying to more stringently enforce Scottish laws in Scotland and uh, makes a series of mistakes and makes himself extremely unpopular to the point where major riots break out in the biggest Scottish, Scottish cities, um, notably Edinburgh. Um, he makes himself so kind of hated in Scotland that even the Scottish army rebels against him, so he has like no power to enforce the laws that he wants to enforce anymore. There's basically a Scottish revolution, an uprising against him. Question? This is under King Charles. Yeah. So he's just like burning his bridges everywhere? Yep, and it's, that's a good way to put it because it's going to kind of turn out the same way for him, which if you burn your bridges, is usually not a good long term strategy. <laughs> uh, Oh, series of things. Uh, there's a kind of tax reform that a lot of them looked at as um, hustling them out of their money. <laughs> uh, there's a religious facet to it. He tries to bring the English version of the Bible into Scotland, which a lot of Scotch people didn't like, and that started a lot of riots outside of churches. Um, and there's just a general kind of political conflict of this new king trying to enforce laws with a degree that they haven't seen in a couple decades and they don't like it. So there's several facts, there's several different reasons that people don't like this king. Question? No, there won't be a, much of a question about uniting both countries for another hundred years until the 1700s. Some people might talk about it, but it's, there's no momentum to really do that for a long time. Other questions? Nope. Um, the rioting and the, the rebellion against the king of Scotland gets so out of control that there's nothing he can do to stop it. Uh, his own army won't follow his orders in Scotland anymore. Um, and a big chunk of the Scottish army actually starts invading England. They move out of Scotland and start attacking northern England and conquering land. And he's got a gigantic problem on his hands now. Uh, he has to send out the English army, his English army, to go fight off his Scottish army. So this is a real threat of civil war between his two countries, uh, possibly even within his two countries each. Uh, so he's involved in all kinds of problems. Uh, the English army doesn't really, for the most part, want to go out and fight, so the Scottish army is just taking, gobbling up land and land and lands, moving further and further south, and uh, they demand a ransom payment from the English government, basically pay us a thousand dollars a day, which back then was a huge amount of money, and uh, if you make the daily payments, then we will stop attacking. Yeah. Uh, he has no ability to pay, because he, he's running like a balanced budget, he doesn't want to go into debt, but he can't get more tax revenue because to raise taxes, you have to pass a new tax law, right? But there's no parliament to pass a tax law because he's dissolved it. So he's in this conundrum. Eventually, he decides to call parliament back to try to make a deal with them. And uh, the deal that they'll try to 
make is to say, okay, we'll pass a tax increase so you can pay these guys to stop attacking us. In return, we want a promise, a law that the king agrees to that the king cannot dissolve parliament whenever he feels like it. So that negotiation goes on for a while and that is a a difficult negotiation. <laughs> they, they're really angry at each other. So toward the end of 1641, the laws are about to pass, the king is going to support it, but there's so much anim- animosity between especially five very um, kind of complaining leaders of parliament and the king and him and his side. Uh, the king gets so angry at these five guys, especially in Parliament. The leader is named John Pym. That's why his picture's up here. Um, the kind of critic of the king. That the king eventually orders all five of them arrested one night in January 1642. Uh, so many people interpret that as the king just trying to throw his, uh, his opponents in jail, shut them up so he can get what he wants. Um, these five leaders of parliament get wind of this plot and so they leave London. They run away so that they don't get arrested. So they avoid being arrested in that night and they get outside of the city and they basically escape. And uh, a lot of other guys in parliament don't trust the king very much anymore. They're very angry that he would have done this. Um... So the leaders of parliament are in contact with the Scottish rebels and will eventually form an alliance with the Scottish rebels uh, to keep the pressure on the king. Basically, as long as the Scots are in the north uh, raising a problem for the king, that puts pressure on the king to form agreements with parliament. So parliament thinks this, this is their maneuver to get more and more concessions from the king. Does that make sense? Questions about this at all? Uh, well, that gets into the their, the plot to arrest them causes riots in London itself. Uh, riots that are so violent that the king's army can't even stop the riot. So their last ditch effort to save the king is to get him outside of the city because they feel that his own people are a threat to him. So the king escapes with his advisors. They all leave London. And they go out to the kind of western edge of England where the king has most of his political support, where the big landowners are out there, his favorites. And they agree to basically hide him. And uh, from there, uh, the leaders of parliament say that the king has done this cowardly thing, this embarrassing thing to him. He shouldn't have done this. He should have remained in the capital city to run the government. Um, so basically parliament accuses the king of not being reliable the king accuses parliament of having led these riots um, and basically they both start raising armies to attack each other the king calls his soldiers to his aid and uh, the leaders of parliament will start asking for volunteer soldiers to defend London against their own king So this is going to be a civil war between king and parliament. And they take to the battlefield. They start attacking each other. Um, The king's army in the first real year of the fighting, 1642, the kind of summer and fall, 1642, they get really close to London. London's here. They get really close to taking the city and probably winning the war. Um, It seems that the city itself... The, some of the average men just never been trained in the army uh, take up shovels and rakes and stuff like that just basic types of weapons and they surround the city so that the king's army cannot attack the king only has maybe 20,000 troops on his side London is a huge city by this point it has probably 150,000 people in it so just by a popular call to go defend your own city That's how they keep the king's forces out. 
Um, the next year, 1643, the king's armies, you can see, are winning a lot of the battlefield and taking over a lot of the country. But they lose a uh, kind of big battle up in the north against a Scots led army. Um, and from there, it's really downhill. Uh, Parliament starts raising larger and larger armies, largely through a draft, because they have the major population centers on their side. So they draft soldiers into their army. They eventually build an army that's twice as large as the king's. And that's really how they win on the battlefield and eventually win the war and take the king prisoner by uh, the end of 1645. And here is their method of doing it. This giant army is called the New Model Army. It is massive. Uh, the king had maybe 20,000 troops on his side tops. The New Model Army, through drafting soldiers, eventually grows to about 45,000 or so. So they have at least twice as much as the king. It's a gigantic army for England for its time. It's like unthinkably large. Um, so they have the king prisoner. Um, it seems that the Civil War is over, but now you start getting into some conflicts between the leaders of Parliament and the army leaders, the new model army leaders. The leaders of parliament say, basically, we've captured the king, war is over, the soldiers can go home. But these soldiers haven't been paid for a long time. And they refuse to go home until they're paid. They refuse to disperse. So now it's become basically a three-way civil war between the king, the parliament, and parliament's army. And the army leaders realize that they have a really strong negotiating position because they can just attack parliament and start throwing those guys in jail. Um, eventually, by 1647 in the summer, the army surrounds London itself. Parliament's army, the new model army. And they basically say, you're either going to pay us and send us home, or we will attack the city and take over the government and throw all you guys in jail and then take our money. And when Parliament hesitates, they do attack the city and conquer the city and throw a bunch of these leaders of Parliament in jail. Question? Why, why, would, they, why would Parliament not just... Why would they just pay them? Well, they basically say that we're the elected leaders of the government. How dare you do this? You're under our authority. Do they Oh, they probably deserve because they've won on the battlefield against the king's army. But you know, it's hard to come up with that kind of money that quickly. So their tactic is: How dare you do this? Why don't you calm down? And maybe over the next five years, we'll trickle the money out and pay you off. But there's all kinds of proposals out there, right? This is going on for months. Right. Meanwhile, the king is sitting in like one of his own uh, palaces, basically under house arrest. So he's he's in one of his own homes, but he's not really allowed to leave, and they're like controlling who his guests are and all that kind of stuff. And Charles, the king, thinks that this is really useful to him that the army. The new model army and parliament are bickering against each other because he is running meetings with each side saying, if he goes to the army and say, why don't we make a deal where you, the army, and me, the king, will agree on building a new government where we can kind of punish all these leaders of parliament for what they've been doing. I'll get my throne back and I'll kind of keep the army huge and keep you well paid. But he's also meeting with the leaders of parliament saying, those those damn soldiers won't go home. Why don't, why don't you make a deal with me? I'll send the army away once I get back to the throne. So he's like trying to drive a wedge between his two opponents. Does that make sense? Yeah. Trying to keep them arguing against each other because he feels if his enemies are divided, then he might be able to manipulate that to get his throne back and all of his old power back and basically set things back the way they were. So this is a three-way negotiation <laughs> that goes on for a long time. 
goes on for a year. Does that make sense? Uh, the only thing they can ever really agree on is to pay off the Scots and convince them to go home. That's, that's about the best they accomplish in this kind of moment, 1647 into 1648. And then another group rises. Um, everyone in England knows this stuff is going on. It's no secret. This is front page news. And even people who can't read know that it's going on because people just talk to each other. I mean, rebellions against kings are, they're like once in a lifetime kinds of things. Uh, so this is big, big news. Um, and with the king kind of under house arrest and seemingly no one really running the country, this opens up a big opportunity for people to start publishing books and pamphlets and newspaper articles and all kinds of stuff saying, proposing all kinds of ideas about what the new government should look like. So this is a great opportunity for all these political thinkers out there. How should we make the new English government? King wants his throne back. Parliament wants to enhance their powers. Army wants money and guarantees of stability. Uh, but there's a group, a fairly small group, of what are at the time extreme radicals who propose what we would think of today as a real democracy. Um, they are derisively called the levelers. Derisive meaning derision. It's a word to make fun of them. Um, the levelers, they hate that word, but that's, what's, that's what they've been called ever since in the textbooks. Um, the levelers want several things. So number one, they want full religious toleration of Catholics to, to a certain degree, but mostly for Protestants. Most of the levelers are real Protestants. Um, they want full equality under the law. They do not want a nobility of landowners that get away with lower tax rates and they get to do all these like privileges and they don't have to be punished and all kinds of things. The levelers say, no, everyone should be equal under the law, no matter how rich or how poor, how much land you own or if you own none. So they want all laws enforced equally, no matter who you are. Even if you're a member of the government. They hate monopolies, one, con one company controlling an entire market. They demand public education, a school system paid for by government tax revenue. They want voting rights for all men over 21 years old, so they don't want a landowning qualification on voting. They say you shouldn't have to own property in order to get a vote. And that would open up voting privileges to the mass amount of everyday farmers out there who don't own their own land. They're just working on someone else's land. Does that make sense? But they're not talking about giving voting rights to women or ethnic minorities or indentured servants or anything like that. Um, and they want a written document, some kind of constitution as we would think of it today, to give a full description of the liberties, the rights that people are supposed to have, and the limits of government power. And for its time, the 1640s, these ideas are way far left, way, way out there, out on the liberal side. These are radical leftist ideas for the time. And that's why uh, their enemies call them levelers. It would be like uh, anyone arguing for this stuff today being labeled a communist, that you want to reduce everyone to an absolute equality, even in wages, that there will be no rich and no poor. Everyone will be perfectly equal. That's not what the levelers are talking about, though. So they hated being called levelers, and they fought against it as much as they could. Um, but they publish a huge amount of pamphlets and newspaper articles and all kinds of stuff. Um, for many months, for about a year and a half. And this is uh, the cover page of one of them. Um, 
their enemies also wrote pamphlets attacking them. One of the more interesting ones called them uh, animals in human costume. Yeah, basically saying they're not even men. They're some kind of weird inhuman thing because of these ideas. So that's how outside of normal that uh, the conservatives who want to stop all this try to portray them as. So, but this is a new group. They're ascendant. They're extremely popular, especially amongst many, many soldiers. Um, a colonel from the army, from the new model army, got going with this and started writing the first kind of big pamphlets. Uh, some religious leaders get involved, and um, so there's a large group of them. And they're very popular. These are some of the best sellers of the time. So their ideas are circulating fairly widely, at least to the reading public. Uh, yeah, question. Are there educated men behind this? Uh, a couple of them are pretty highly educated, but a couple of them just rose through the army as average soldiers. Mm -hmm. They went, they volunteered to fight in the war, and just through bravery and knowing how to fight on the battlefield, they got promoted. Mm -hmm. So some of them aren't very highly educated. But you don't have to be highly educated to understand that some of this stuff is important, right? But this, uh, I define it as a new group in what is now basically a four-way civil war between king, parliament, parliament's army, and now this kind of popular group called the Levelers. So it's a very muddy battlefield. It's, it's very complex. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Other questions about the Levelers? No. Nope. Moving on. No? Yes? I don't know. Oh, okay. One person says yes. All right. Um, so, uh, Parliament is debating what to do about the king. They're thinking about making him a king again, put him back on his throne, and maybe with some restricted powers and whatnot. Uh, the leaders of the army, especially General Fairfax, doesn't like that very much. Um, so, while the Parliament is debating... The general sends some uh, soldiers into the, the room, the big kind of banquet hall where they're debating, and has a bunch of them arrested, especially the ones that are pro-king. So this is seen as a purge of the king's friends in parliament. Anyone who's giving speeches and tends to vote to put the king back in office, put him back on his throne and put things back the way they were, um, the general of the army goes in and arrests all these guys and throws them in jail so they can't vote. Um, it's led by a colonel named Thomas Pride, so it becomes known as uh, Pride's Purge to get rid of all the pro-royalist members of parliament. That's what MP stands for up here. Member of parliament. It's like saying congressman today, member of congress. And uh, those who are not arrested are allowed to continue as people in parliament debating and passing laws and whatnot. Um, but they become known as the rump parliament. Because what is a rump? What? Yeah. It's the ass end. It's the leftovers. So rump parliament basically says that this parliament that is still in existence is really just the leftovers of whoever is just going to agree with the army anyway. That's why the army left them in office. Does that make sense? And a lot of people are really pissed off about this. And uh, you can see this is a kind of front page of a pamphlet that's published in London, uh, which is supposed to be a true and full relation of the officers and the army's forcible seizing of diverse eminent members of the Commons House, uh, House of Parliament. Um, on the night of December 6th and 7th, 1648. So this is uh, like an eyewitness account of how these dastardly soldiers went in there and arrested the good members of parliament, threw them all in jail, and left us with this leftover parliament that's really just a, a shill for the army. So a lot of people are very angry about this. Does that make sense? And you can see this is... Uh, 
it should say December, yeah, December 6 and 7, 1648, so the very end of 1648. And this is seen when the, as a point in time when the army is really starting to take over, eliminating its enemies. Uh, every once in a while, some of the levelers are arrested and thrown in jail for the stuff that they were publishing. So that goes on for a few months, too. They're usually arrested for a couple of weeks and then let out, and they publish something else, they get arrested again, and it goes on as a cycle over and over again for a while. Yeah? Who is the Fairfax? He's a general of the army, general. the head general, the, the big leader of the army. Still moving on? More questions? Say again? Member of Parliament. Yeah. And you can see this one, this article in particular, is a kind of has a religious slant on it. Um, basically saying we've discovered this conspiracy, this remonstrance and proceedings to drive on and promote the Jesuits and the Papists, the Catholics. Uh, Jesuit and Papist designs to subversion of religious, of religion, parliament, monarchy, and the fundamentals of laws and government. The Catholics are taking over. <coughs> so this one has a religious slant, but uh, there's several others that just make a political complaint. Good. Moving on. Okay. Um, next thing they do is they decide to bring the king on in and put him on trial. So they file formal charges against him. Does anyone want to take a guess at what the charges against him were? The big one, at least. Treason against his own people. Treason against the English people. Um which is a remarkable thing to say for the time. Uh, so this is a, a painting, an image of the king at his defense. He's going to have his own lawyer, his own little table. Um, his trial will occur in parliament. So the leaders of parliament that have filed the charges against him, they will be like their own prosecution lawyers. He'll have his own defense lawyer. Um, they'll call witnesses and they'll have this little trial. And Parliament sets themselves up as the jury. So uh, does anyone know what his, uh, or want to take a guess at what his legal defense, his whole theory of defense is? No? He says, I'm the king. I am appointed by God. It is impossible for me to commit treason against my own people because I'm doing God's will. He says, the, the entire idea that I can possibly go against my own people is, it, it's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. He says, there's no way that you can convict me or punish me for something that I cannot do. He says, this whole proceedings makes no sense at all. And... Uh, it's basically a, a very quick trial because he says that and then it goes to the jury to decide if he's guilty or innocent. And guess what they find? No, they find him guilty because they don't like him. Um, so they find him guilty of uh, treason against his own people. Uh, next big question is, what do you do with a king who's guilty of treason against his own people? <laughs> do you, like, uh, fine him? You make him pay some money? Put him under house arrest for a few months and let him out? The major problem that the leaders of parliament seemed to be worried about was uh, as long as the king's around, there's a real possibility of civil war. Because if the king ever gets out of jail, or if you send him out of the country, if he comes back to the country, he could raise an army and start another war, right? So, what's the best solution to stop that? kill him. That's what they decide to do. They decide to execute him. And they do. So uh, he's taken out into a public square in London on January 30th the next year, so about a month after his trial. 
um, they chop his head off. King goes splat. Um, a lot of people witness this because this doesn't happen often in European monarchies. People complain about kings sometimes, but getting the upper hand over a king in, to be able to execute him, that, that's a big, big step and to actually make the decision to do it. Um, so a lot of people witness this and uh, the reports from the diaries and letters that we have from people who wrote down what they saw that day uh, seems to be that the people immediately regretted this. That once the axe fell and killed the king, um, there wasn't like big cheering in the streets or anything. It seems to be more like the axe fell and he heard this, eh, like, damn, wish we didn't do that one. Uh, but the king is dead. Uh, the family, his wife and children, are sent out of the country into exile. So they go to France. The king of France gives them a kind of place to live, a little palace and all that. Give honors them. Um, so they are out. Uh, Parliament is now running the country. Parliament starts kind of passing some laws trying to set up a new government. Uh, the first one, the first big one that they passed is to abolish not just this king, but they abolish the idea of having a king. So they say, we will never have a king again. So this is Parliament. Yep. This is what Parliament says. Two days later, they pass another law that abolishes the House of Lords. Um, Parliament, just like Congress in the United States, had two houses. There's a lower house called the House of Commons, which is where the elected guys of Parliament go. <clears throat> Then there's an upper house called the House of Lords. And if you're just a big landowner, you never have to get elected. You're a lord. So you go and sit in the House of Lords and help pass laws. Does that make sense? So the House of Commons says that this thing is way too much like a monarchy. It's a family inheritance of political power. So they abolish the House of Lords two days later. So the House of Commons, the elected members of Parliament, were one the country, and they declare England a commonwealth. The government is supposed to interact with and work with and help the people to make a better society. The people have a fair degree of equality. And they start endorsing some new laws, uh, especially some leveler ideas, calling for um, all men have the right to vote and they're going to have new elections to elect a new parliament so a new group will write a constitution and do all these things. Does that make sense? So the House yeah. of Lords, you said, was the elected members of parliament? No, the House of Commons. House of Commons. Yeah, they're the elected members. The House of Lords are the lords. The landlords. The landlords. Oh. Yeah. So they seem, in 1649, all set and ready to go to build their new government, which you could call a kind of democracy. So this, some historians have written about this as a, a movement toward democracy in England. Um, doesn't happen, though, because uh, the general Fairfax retires, and the second in command kind of becomes a new general. His name is Cromwell. Um, he basically doesn't trust the English people to have real equality. He doesn't trust democracy. Um, they try to hold these elections. The new government is kind of moderate, is wishy-washy, doesn't really do a whole lot successfully. Uh, so he, with his army, basically takes over the government. Um, he consolidates power. He brings the army in, arrests a lot of the leaders of parliament, throws them in jail, and basically declares himself the new leader of the country. Um, this happens in phases over a couple years. But by 1650, 1651, he's pretty solidly in power and he's running the government. Question? Yeah, so he was, uh, he wasn't from the parliament, so... No. Nope. Well, he was a member of parliament. He had been elected also. <coughs> so he's a member of parliament and also the general of the army. But he doesn't agree with the parliament he's talking about. He doesn't agree with the new leaders of parliament at all. And he thinks that they're so weak-willed that they're going to destroy the country, and he knocks them out. 
takes over and he says, I'm ruling for the stability and health of the English people. I can get things done. And they let him? Well, a lot of English people are really pissed off that he's doing this, but anyone who complains is arrested, oh. thrown in jail. And sometimes you sit in jail for years and years. It's not like the United States today where you have laws that say if you're put in jail, you have to like go before a judge and have charges filed against you and go to trial at some point fairly soon. Um, back then, you get thrown in jail, you could sit there the rest of your life without ever seeing a trial. It's just whenever the, the government decided to convene a trial. So getting thrown in jail is a very, very, or much more scary thing. It's pretty scary today, I imagine. I've never been thrown in jail, but... Um, I imagine it's not a fun experience. But it was much worse back then. And governments back then tended to literally torture prisoners to get them to confess to crimes. So it, it's very scary, the idea of going to jail back then. It's a real threat to your life. So uh, Cromwell takes over. He calls himself the protector of England. Um, there is a he eventually closes Parliament completely and just runs the country and passes laws himself and does all kinds of things. Um, so his official title will be um, Lord High Protector of the Realm. Something like yeah, There it is. I knew I wrote this down somewhere. So it's up there in the slide. So he gets rid of Parliament completely in 1653 and just runs the country himself. Uh, most people look at him as a king, but he had also led the anti-king movement, so he can't call himself king, but he has all the powers of king, um, declares that his eldest son will inherit his power when he dies, so it yeah. really looks like a new monarch. Yeah. But you know, if he was one of the leaders of parliament that really wanted to execute the last king, so being famous for that, you can't really call yourself king. He's fired. Yeah without being called a hypocrite, at least. Yeah. Uh, but he does a lot of stuff. Also, internationally, um, he wants to make England into a major imperialist power, so he launches imperial wars, especially in uh, the Americas, uh, especially going after Dutch colonies in the Caribbean and some places in North America. <coughs> he will also uh, launch a major invasion of Ireland, to try to conquer Ireland outright, which at that time was a foreign country. And the Irish are very resistant to that. Um, the English invasion of Ireland looks almost genocidal. It's extraordinarily violent. Uh, basically, the English army shows up, just starts kicking Irish people off their land and killing anyone who complains and uh, kind of parceling up that land and giving it or selling it to English landowners. So it's outright colonization. And uh, he actually gets sick. He gets malaria in Ireland and dies. Uh, but that starts off a series of conflicts between the English and the Irish over who really should control Ireland. That goes on for hundreds of years. Does anyone know when that ended? 1999. <laughs> so it just ended 17 years ago. This conflict, this intermittent warfare, what the Irish call a revolution against the English colonists. So it goes back and forth. There's atrocities and assassinations and all kinds of bombings and stuff in our own modern times that went on for years and years and years. Um, and that was a long-term conflict. Um, that's part of Cromwell's legacy. So Cromwell dies in 58. Uh, his eldest son kind of takes the throne or the position for like a couple days, but uh, everyone who hates... Uh, Cromwell's a fairly hated person throughout England by this point. He's seen as a tyrant, a dictator. Uh, so a lot of people hated Cromwell. Um, when his son tries to rise to that position, they see this as a good opportunity to just knock the kid out of power and destroy this protectorship government and rebuild the English government. So his son Richard only lasts a couple of days before he's just, just knocked out by popular uprising. And at this point, the English have to figure out 
what are we going to do now? Um, their eventual decision is to try to rebuild the monarchy. The feeling by this point is we haven't had a good, reliable, solid king in 20 years. This is 1658, 59, 60. It's been 20 years of civil war and infighting and dictatorship under Cromwell. So a lot of people, after 20 years of this kind of chaos, they look back on the old monarchs, Charles and his father James, as like, things were so much better back then, right? <laughs> so they eventually decide to invite the dead king, his son, his family, back to England to rebuild the monarchy. So his eldest son, also named Charles, is kind of invited back to London to take the throne again. After they killed his father. Well, you could be resentful and pouty about it and stay in France. Or you could make a deal and go back and be king of the country again, right? So he's very angry about it and he's he's going to punish the people who really led the movement to kill his father. There's no doubt about that. He was exiled. He and his family are living in France. So he had two brothers. I mean, a brother. Yeah, he had his younger brother. Um, this guy never really gets officially married. He has a lot of mistresses, has a lot of kids, but they're never officially like heirs, right? So you have to be married within the, the Church of England to have all that like official heir to the throne title, right? Does that make sense? Um, but he and his family return, and this is generally called the Restoration, because the monarchy is restored. The old family is put back on the throne. And this, uh, this is a famous picture that I like of Charles II, becomes king in 1660 on his return, um, because all of the image of greatness and power and wealth and splendor and prosperity, this all goes to him. So he gets to wear all the full regalia, he gets the big throne, the big hat, and even gets a giant pillow for his feet. And reportedly the people love it because this is the return of stability and honor and ending all the infighting and chaos. Does that make sense? So absolutism, the idea of this king as God's appointed leader on earth and all government power is centered in the king, this idea comes back in a big way in England. And historians also talk about England's willful amnesia. Basically, the idea of democracy and republic, electing your leaders, is humiliated. And a lot of English people seem to just suddenly want to forget about all that and go back to having a king as long as he's like honorable and reliable. Um, the idea of democracy is the butt of many jokes for many years in England afterward. It's like, we tried it and look what it led to. All this infighting and bloodshed. And in the end, we got a Cromwell who no one really liked anyway. Who wasn't very honorable. Uh, so under Charles II... Um, this he will bring back Parliament and there will be kind of consistent elections for Parliament. Uh, the first few Parliaments that serve him for, what, 17 years is known as the Cavalier Parliament, which is basically like the rubber stamp Parliament. They give him whatever he wants. They are so desperate to stay on his good side to keep him happy. Uh, he'll ask for an army of 5,000 troops. Parliament will approve of army of 10,000 troops. Charles will ask for a tax increase of 3% to, I don't know, spend money on doing stuff. They'll give him a tax increase of 10%. They not only give him what he wants, they consistently give him way more than he asked for. Does that make sense? So he's a very powerful king in his own country. Um, one thing that is kept around, though, from these kind of civil wars and revolutions is the ending of feudalism. The idea that the serf farmers are tied to the land through these ancient promises, that was ended in the 1640s and 50s. It was just wiped out. There is no more feudalism one day. The big landowners like it, though, 
because it makes their lands more profitable. Because when feudalism just suddenly ends one day and the serf farmers are no longer tied to the land, they can go wherever they want to be farmers, to work for a big landowner. That sounds good, but in reality it means that they're all unemployed suddenly. Right? Unemployment is massive. So these farmers have to quickly find a job to feed their families. Right? So what happens to wages? They go down because everyone's desperate to get a job. <laughs> so the big landowners like the end of feudalism because it allowed them to pay their workers less, which means that the landowners get to keep more money for themselves. And the landowners are the ones that are the leaders of parliament. So they decide to keep the end of feudalism because it's more profits for them. It's serving their own interests. Does that make sense? And in an interesting move, they at the same time decide to, decide to keep monopolies over foreign markets. Like the British East India Company, or the English East India Company back then, but um, there's a stringent control. One company is allowed to be the only company buying and selling certain goods in certain places. Which is like the opposite of ending feudalism, right? Ending feudalism brings great freedom. You can go wherever you want. Monopoly is the exact opposite. You can only buy and sell from one company. So how can you reconcile the fact that they're supporting all this mass freedom by ending feudalism, but at the same moment supporting huge government restrictions internationally? Why do they do that? Because it's the same rich people in parliament that are investors in these companies. In both instances, they're doing things to drive up their own profits. By making everyone unemployed, by ending feudalism suddenly, but also by keeping the monopolies that they're investors in controlling certain markets. It's all about greed. Well, not always. Sometimes people are more ideological and they want to support uh, market freedoms to end feudalism. But if you're going to support market freedom, then you cannot have monopolies, right? Because a monopoly is a restricted market. It's a controlled market. So people arguing for free markets should want to break up monopolies. So some people are ideological. These guys aren't. <laughs> They're in it for money. They will support whichever ideology will make them the most money. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and uh, under Charles II, they continue launching wars, especially against the Dutch in uh, the Americas. Uh, this is when the English take over uh, the colony of New Amsterdam, which they renamed New York. It was at first a Dutch colony, a Dutch city. So they rename it New York because York is in England. Pretty simple. They don't want to name an English colony after a Dutch city anymore. It's a way to remind people that they're conquered. So that's where you get New York from. Or at least a change in the name to New York. Um, okay. Questions about any of these? Nope. All right. Uh, as you get into the 1670s and especially early 80s, uh, the big problem is that Charles got to the throne when he was already middle-aged. Um, I think he's something like 30 years old or so. Uh, he's on the throne for 25 years, but he never officially gets married. He has all tons of mistresses, tons of so-called illegitimate children, because they're not coming from a woman who he's married to through the church. Um, so he doesn't have any official children to be heirs to his throne. So he convinces Parliament to pass a law naming his younger brother James to be the official heir. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, this creates a problem, though. Uh, people believe that the first Charles was Catholic. People generally believe that he raised his children to be Catholic, so Charles II is probably Catholic. Charles II is smart enough not to say that, though, in public. Right? 
Um, the rumor is that he converts officially to Catholicism on his deathbed. But it is very well known that James, the younger brother, is staunchly Catholic, publicly Catholic. And this brings up the possibility of a, another civil war between Protestants and Catholics. If James gets to the throne, Protestants, who are becoming a majority of England, become worried that James will launch a new persecution and try to force all the Protestants to convert to Catholicism again. Does that make sense? So why do the Protestants in England accept this law that he will be the next king? It's really because James is already an adult and he has kids. And so this is his family tree. You don't have to write all this down. So James is up here on this chart, up at the top. He had a first wife um, who had two daughters. He had two daughters with his first wife. Um, and then his first wife died. His oldest daughter, when she grew up, she marries a guy from uh, the Dutch Republic. His name is William of Orange. These two are staunchly Protestant. Does that make sense? And when they passed a law naming James the heir to the throne, um, these are his only kids, these two daughters. And Anne is also a pretty clear Protestant. So the Protestants support James to be the next king because they figure he ain't going to be around long. He may be king for about 10 years or so, but when he dies, we're going to get this Protestant line again, so they'll have babies and whatnot, so we'll have Protestant kings forever. Does it make sense? But after the law is passed, he gets remarried. And after he becomes king, he has a baby. And he makes the unbelievably stupid public announcement that he will raise that boy to be extremely Catholic. <coughs> And because it's a sexist society, even though this boy is younger than the two kind of half-sisters, the boy is going to be the next king, right? So suddenly, the Protestants got a big problem. If we allow this guy to remain king, the throne is going to go to his son, and he's going to have sons and blah, blah, blah. We're going to have Catholic kings forever. So the Protestants hatch a plot to go make contact with his oldest daughter, Mary, and her husband, who is one of the leaders of the Dutch government, secret messages are sent by English Protestants from London to the Dutch Republic. Basically saying, why don't you get the Dutch Navy together and a bunch of soldiers and invade England and all the Protestants in England will rise up and help you invade our country to kick out our Catholic monarchs and we'll allow you guys to be king and queen. Does that make sense? And basically, in 17, or 1689, four years into James's rule, his daughter and her husband leads an invasion against him. And the English Protestants rise up, and it uh, appears that James panics um, and runs away, leaves the country. And this becomes known as the Glorious Revolution of 1689. Uh, glorious for two main reasons. Number one, there is virtually zero fighting on a battlefield. The Dutch army shows up. The English Protestants come out in public and say they'll support the Dutch invasion. And the Catholic royal family runs away. They go to France. So there's very little actual fighting. And what might be a second reason for calling this the Glorious Revolution? Who's calling this the Glorious Revolution? The Protestants. the Protestants. Because they get a Protestant monarchy. And they become known as the co-kings. So the Protestants see this as overthrowing the horrible Catholic monarchy bloodlessly. It's a bloodless revolution, pretty much. Only four people are killed in it or something like that. But to overthrow a monarchy without massive devastation is seen as God's intervention in the world. Right? God's intervention to help the good Protestants of England. Uh, 
so William and Mary will be king and queen. Uh, Mary will die after a couple of years. And William will continue as king of England until his own death in well, 1701 or something like that. Uh, this has a big impact. Like Stuff is renamed in the American colonies. The 13 colonies, if you've ever heard of that. Like there's colleges named after them. The, the, yeah, the, the best college in Virginia is called the College of William and Mary. Yeah, yeah. I lived by there yep. for four years. Yep. All right, so... Um, all right, uh, so Mary dies in, I guess, 94. Her husband continues as king until his own death. They never had any kids, any official kids at least. Um, so Mary's younger sister, Anne, becomes the next queen. And uh, when Anne becomes queen... The Catholic monarchs that are supposed to be the official monarchs of England are sitting in France saying, hey, remember us, and the English Protestants no, say, no, we want to forget you. Uh, so that happens for about 100 years. Every time there's a change in monarch in England with Protestants, the Catholics in France say, hey, remember us, we're supposed to be kings, and it never really gets anywhere. But there's always a threat that they may uh, come in with the French army and try to overthrow the English government and set themselves up again. So that's always a worry that the English Protestants have. But Anne becomes the next queen. Uh, she doesn't have any kids, so when she dies in 1714, uh, they have to find someone else. But they'll desperately, desperately just keep looking for Protestants. They eventually import, in 1714, a German guy who doesn't even speak English just because he's Protestant. And that's where the Georges come from. And that's the current royal family today. So they came from... One of the Germanies, uh, it was Hanover, I think, something like that. Imported king because uh, 20 generations back, there was like someone who was a nephew of this family going way back, you know, hundreds of years or something like that. And that's how they justified bringing in this German guy to be the new English king. Just because he promised to be Protestant. Um, yep. And Hanover is, uh, oh, here it is, Hanover. Yep, northern Germany, as we think of it today. Uh, all right, so there's... All right, uh, the official, the kind of end point of all this discussion, what does this really accomplish for England? England is still not a full-fledged democracy. At this point, you know, early 1700s, they'll, they're still run by monarchs, and it's hugely important who that monarch is, especially depending if you're Protestant. Um... They desperately are trying to figure out how to keep Protestants on the throne somehow. Um, but in the settlement that kicked the Catholics out, uh, the new King William and Queen Mary, they have to make a deal with Parliament to set up this new government. And in that negotiation, Parliament gets a much stronger say in stuff, uh, especially over the military and over finance raising taxes and how to spend the money. So Parliament is empowered through all of this at the end. And the leaders of Parliament will basically uh, negotiate in person with the monarchs to decide what the government will do. Which is basically how it still happens today, except the monarchs really don't negotiate at all. They just let the leaders of Parliament do whatever. Uh, number two, they get a law passed called the Triennial Act, um, which is really pretty easy to understand because of the tri part. It says that the monarch, whoever it is, must call Parliament at least once every three years. And with the Act of No Dissolution, the monarch cannot just dissolve Parliament in the middle of its session whenever the monarch feels like it. So these laws are still there today. They're still on the books. Um, today, there's so much for the what is today the, the UK government, the United Kingdom, um, to do that it pretty much meets constantly, year-round. So they take vacations and whatnot, but they're virtually always in session, much like the US Congress is today. They're, they're always, they take vacations every once in a while, but they're always meeting, passing laws and debating and whatnot. That's still enacted today. Yeah. 
and they have since passed a law saying that you have to hold an election for parliament at least once every five years. And in the UK, uh, Britain, uh, they just had their most recent election about a year ago. I think it was like last May, something like that. It was last spring, 2015. And they dragged that one out as long as they could because the last election before that was almost exactly five years before. It was in the spring 2010. Because they were afraid of, if they had an election, uh, they were going to lose. So they dragged it out as long as they could. And who decides when to have an election? Parliament does. <laughs> so they don't have, uh, like in the United States, it's exactly every two years and four years and all that for certain offices. Uh, they just decided. If they want to have an election next month, they can just pass a law saying, okay, we're having elections next month, even though it's just a year since the last one. So, yeah. All right. Um, the government also creates the Bank of England. The Bank of England becomes hugely important. Um, the Bank of England is like the U.S. Treasury. It's where the money goes, the tax revenue. Um, and they also will pass laws that saying that the Bank of England can borrow money based off their anticipated tax revenue. Which basically means they're going to create a national debt. And because England at this point is starting to be seen as one of the kind of safer countries, one of the more consistent countries, uh, England has not undergone a revolution since, to our own day. Um, or at least in England itself. There's been revolutions against English control of certain places. Um, but they will build a huge national debt. They're going to start borrowing large amounts of money, which they will build an empire out of. And they will spend giant amounts of money on their navy, especially to conquer places all over the world and set up the giant British Empire of the 1700s. And just like you see with the United States today, when you build up a huge military, um, they hire private companies to build those boats and guns and make the uniforms and all the stuff that's going to supply the military, right? So you have contractor companies, defense contractors as we call it today, um, that sell a huge amount of stuff to the government. And they just become extremely profitable companies, just like today. And some of the leaders of parliament are investors in those companies. So they'll keep passing laws to buy more stuff from a company at hugely inflated prices because they're, they own stock in the company. The more stuff the company sells, the higher value the stock is, right? So, and companies use their huge profits to reinvest in politics to win elections to keep their friends in power. Sound familiar? Yep, still happening today. So, um, a lot of the end point is, through all these revolutions, you've had changes in kings, changes in government styles to a certain extent, but the rich still basically own the government. <coughs> big mercantilists, big what we today call corporate powers, big businesses, tend to own the election system because they take a small part of their massive profits and they give bribes, what we today call political contributions, campaign contributions, um, to guys running for office, today women running for office too, um, and they basically buy candidates. And they win elections because they're spending so much more money than their opponents. So England, um, in the early 1700s, they... This is when they passed a law in like 1708 or something like that. They passed a law in England and Scotland at the same time to unite their two countries. So they become known as Great Britain at that point. They become the British Empire. <clears throat> but Britain back then can claim to have overthrown absolutism, right? 
The idea that the king is the center of government, the king has all the power of government. They can say that they overthrew that, and they, they have a fair degree of democracy because parliament is really powerful now, and parliament is really run by voting. So they can claim to have a democracy, to have overthrown absolutism, but in reality, you have a government that is still controlled by the rich. It is still corrupt through what we today call the campaign contribution system. And the British today have set limits on contributions and when you can give the money, how much, and uh, how much advertising each party and candidate's allowed to do in public and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the United States is a lot different from that because it's unlimited now in the United States since 2010. If you ever hear the Citizens United Supreme Court decision, that's what that's all about. Um, So you can claim to have a democracy, but how much of a democracy do you have if the rich are really deciding who gets elected? That's the question I always ask. And uh, the British national debt just absolutely skyrockets in the 1700s. It's pretty unbelievable, which will lead to the American Revolution. So they have big consequences for these decisions. So, making sense? Any questions about all this? All good? All right. We'll stop there. So make sure you leave your uh, questions in the folder.